My name is Sylvia Max. I was born in Philadelphia in 1920. No. <laughs> <laughs> I was born. <laughs> <laughs> you're on camera. With me. <laughs> you're on camera, you're all flustered. My name is Sylvia Max. I was born in Philadelphia uh, on September 18th, 1924. What were your parents like? My father came from Romania when he was two years old. And my mother was born in Philadelphia and they got married in October of 1923. They both were hard of hearing and uh, red lips um, and my sister and I learned to read lips. Uh, my parents um, knew how to use sign, but they only used it with their friends. Uh, my grandparents, my on my mother's side, were Max and Fanny Buten, and they had come over from Russia. My mother's uh, parents were from uh, Russia and my father's parents were from Romania. My mother was born in Philadelphia and my father was born in Romania. We lived near their family and uh, they helped in taking care of them until I was old enough. Uh, as soon as I could speak and walk around, I guess. What was your role in the family? Um, when I was about four years old, I was the ears for them and um, let them know when my little sister was crying and I had to go to the grocery store with my mother because the um, grocer didn't always understand what she said. She, she couldn't speak clearly. And, and then from then on, uh, I was the one that uh, kept in touch with her siblings in New York. We couldn't speak on the phone, so I had to write letters and postcards. What were some <laughs> other difficulties growing up with two deaf parents? When, when I spoke to them, it was hard to get my feelings across to them. Did your family easily ex express emotions? Uh, they didn't very much. Only I, I know when my mother got very angry, you could understand every word she said. But they were, they were very caring and uh, taught us to be neat and put things away yeah. where they belong. Did you have any siblings? Yes, I had a younger sister who was a, about four years younger than I. And it was my responsibility to let my parents know when she was crying or needed something. And then as we got older, um, and she would go out and wouldn't come back on time, and then I'd have to go find her. Describe what life was like maybe when you guys were like teenagers in high school? Actually, before that, it was the Depression. What was it like growing up through the Depression? How old were you? Or how about, um, I'll ask that again. Don't yeah, because I, yeah, I was like, wait, sure. So um, about how, how, we can think about it right now. About how old were you, do you think? Well, the Depression was 19? in the 30s. Yeah. So I was five, six years old. Six years, okay. By the time I was six years old, I think I was really conscious of it because I remember going out to buy a pair of shoes because our feet had grown and uh, I asked my mom, because I was conscious of the fact that we didn't have that much uh, money to spend and are you sure? Can we afford, uh, could we afford a new pair of shoes? And, you know, mom would say, yes, it's all right. Don't worry about it. What was it like growing up through the Depression? 
well, early on, I guess I was about six years old, I was conscious of the fact that mom was uh, very careful with what we bought and how much money she spent. And I remember one time when she, I needed a new pair of shoes and we went to the store and I thought they were a lot of money and said to my mother, I don't need them. She says, well, your other shoes don't fit. You've got to get them. When I was little, up until I was 13 years old, we lived this next street over. And when I was 13, we moved next door. Mm -hmm. And then we were really close. Um, my grandmother lived really close to us and she was a big help too with my parents. And um, I remember that she had a lump on her forehead. And in order to hide it, I remember watching her when she washed and combed her hair. She would bend all the way over and take a comb and comb all her hair into the front and grab it and plunk it on her head to hide that big lump. But she was wonderful. I loved her dearly. And um, we never had a phone. And the only, if I wanted to make phone calls, I, we had to go to her house. And be, even before that, people would call the nearest drugstore, which was a block away, and they would send um, a child, a kid, that would hang around and would come to our house and say, you've got a phone call, and we'd have to go over to the drugstore and answer the phone until we were able to uh, get, use my grandmother's phone. I learned how to play the piano, and oh, oh, I had a lot of cousins, and we went to my grandmother's every Sunday. Uh, the whole family would go, the ones that still lived in Philadelphia. And the kids used to play, we used to play all kinds of games. And I had a cousin um, who made a marionette show. And the kids used to go upstairs to my grandmother's bedroom and we uh, set up the, the uh, marionettes up there and make up a story and then we'd call our parents up to see and we charged them a dime a person and we had lots of fun doing that and listening to the radio on Sundays Walter Winchell and Jack Benny was on and, and uh, all those programs and we always, and then if we got tired doing that, we always went out to play. What were some of the things that you would play? Um, others, oh, when we came home from school, uh, we'd go home for a, a glass of milk, and then we had to go out and play. Um, we, I had a tricycle. And then the girls, when my sister and I would play, if it was raining, we'd sit up on our porch. We had an open front porch, and uh, we played with our dolls, played house, and we played jacks. That's what girls used to play. And points, throwing a ball against the steps in front of the house. And the boys would play dead man's box in the street or we play Red Rover, Red Rover. Very different than video games and v Facebook. Very so. different. We were active and out and away from under our parents. Yeah. Did you ever get picked on for being short? Or oh, always. I was always called shrimp or shorty or... Um, and then I would respond, but good things come in small packages. And then the other guys would say, but so would soda's poison. So you get used to being teased like that. And it was fun anyway. I'd always be first one in line. And uh, I did well in school. And uh, I even, I remember in 
it must have been second grade, where it was a Christmas uh, program in the auditorium, and they put me up on a chair to recite was the night before Christmas. And I used to play the, the piano to accompany some of the singing. Um, I also went to Sunday school with my sister and cousin, and we used to have to walk six or eight blocks or longer. It was a long walk along Cop Creek Parkway to get there on Sunday morning. And when we got a little older, like maybe 11, 10, and I had the bright idea. We, we really didn't like going to Sunday school much, but I said, let's play hooky. We never did anything like this in our lives before. And you would figure the day we picked to play hooky, it had been snowing and it was cold and the snow was melting. And to stay out in this till 12 o'clock, it was, almost impossible. We came home early and my parents asked, why are you home so early? And I can't remember what excuse my, that I and my cousin, who was older than my sister, later on my sister ratted on us and we were punished. <laughs> I don't remember. We, we really got chewed out. What were your high school days like? I was a grade ahead of myself because in elementary school I had skipped two grades. And uh, I graduated when I was 16. I had gotten very good marks and I was el eligible to try out for a scholarship to the University of Pennsylvania. But I really was immature and scared to death and when it came to the oral, I did well in the, in the written section of the test, but when it came to the oral test, I heard somebody in front of me taking the French oral test and I heard her just whizzing right through it and I thought I'd never be able to do that. And the fact that you had to learn how to swim, you had to be able to swim to get into Penn and uh, I couldn't swim, and I was afraid to put my head under water. When I graduated high school, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. And in those days, the only things women could really do was to either be a teacher or a nurse or work in an office. And I decided I'd uh, work for my uncles who had a paint Store, paint stores and uh, retail stores, and they had an office in, in Philadelphia. And instead I went to, uh, first I went to business school and worked in an office for about a year and decided this isn't for me. I learned how to type. I couldn't take shorthand because I quit and then worked at Buten's paint store, which was my uncle's, in the office. And I got tired of that quickly. And then uh, my aunt suggested, why don't you uh, investigate medical technician, which was something new at the time. And I found a school that I could go to for a year. And I graduated from that and got a very good job in a lab. That's what, where I worked for seven years and loved it the whole time. And uh, an aunt of mine suggested that I investigate medical technology. And I did find a school that I could go to and learn and became a medical technologist. And I got a very good job in a small lab. And I worked seven years at that until I got married. But I loved the job, taking blood from people and finding out if they had diabetes and all kinds of things. I even did uh, pregnancy tests on rabbits, operating on them, and then sewing them back up again. What would be the purpose of 
doing a pregnancy test on a rabbit? Well, at the only time, at that time, the only way you could get any kind of answer is to inject the urine of the woman into the ear of the rabbit three days in a row and wait a couple days and then open up the rabbit and examine her ovaries and see if they had gotten pink and swollen and that meant that the woman was pregnant. Times have changed. Oh, times have changed a great deal with all the tests. I used to make all the reagents uh, to make the tests and we didn't, uh, we didn't know anything about c cholesterol in those days at least. They didn't know how to test for it. This was when they were drafting men to go into the army and they had to have blood tests done for syphilis is okay. what it was and that's what I did. Where were you when you found out about Pearl Harbor? I think I was in Atlantic City because our family used to go to Atlantic City during the summer. And do you remember like being like shocked? I was in, yeah, yeah, abs I didn't fully understand what was going on. We l used to listen to the uh, news broadcasts and Walter Winchell. I wasn't conscious of what was going on. All, all I knew was when I graduated, um, what it was like picking up the newspaper every day. The front page would be filled with the casualties from the war. Quite a few of the boys that I graduated with were killed or badly injured. We did go um, the girls did. I belonged to a group of young women who um, went to the Fort Dix camp, the army camp that was in New Jersey. And we used to, they used to have dances for the soldiers. And I remember Al telling me that this, they made them come to the dances and he didn't want to come one time because he was so sick. He didn't feel well at all. And he just sat in the corner and the girls came over and tried to make him feel better and try to get him to dance. Well, definitely the main thing was that the women had to go to work and had to find ways for their children to be taken care of while they were gone. And also during the war, we had rationing uh, of sugar and meat and uh, gasoline and some other things. And that was restrictive in that um, if you had a car, which we didn't, uh, but you really couldn't go uh, that travel that far. We always used public transportation, which there was a lot of in Philadelphia, so that wasn't a problem. And of course, everybody was relieved at the end of the war when rationing was taken away. How did you feel about FDR? Oh, our family thought he was the best thing ever. And he was for four years four um, terms, and when he died, that was a really a shock. I remember that. I was coming home from, from work, I guess, and uh, they used to have newsboys that sold the newspapers, and if it was a big story, they would come into the neighborhoods. And I remember seeing one of those new boys saying, you know, extra, extra, President Roosevelt died. That was a really a shocker. What was the day that you and Albert got married? Uh, March 20th. <laughs> 64 years, so that's... <laughs> we were married March 20th. 1949 
and Al passed away on June 19th, 2013. How did you meet Albert? It was a blind date. Um, his nephew uh, ate lunch in a, uh, a little store next to where the lab was, where I was working. And um, his nephew said to me, he was my age, and he said, uh, I have an uncle I think who would like you. And I said, I don't want to go out with an old man. And he said, no, no, he's our age. And uh, he came to check me out and asked me out for a date, and that was it. Well, Al called me and asked if he could come and see me where I was working. He had, a, he had been a salesman for Canada Dry and he had a stop to make in the area where I worked. And he came to check, check me out, and uh, he liked what I saw, I guess, what he saw, and uh, asked me to go with him to uh, a soda shop uh, for an ice cream soda on Thursday night, and he picked me up and we went and uh, we had a nice conversation and he seemed very nice and then they asked me out for the following week and then after that it was pretty regular and uh, and we were married nine months later <laughs> didn't take long in march what, uh, what did you like about albert when you first met him he was cute and had a nice personality. We had seemed to have a lot in common. And he was gentle. He wasn't pushy. And uh, we just got along great. How did he propose? It wasn't exactly just one proposal. It's just we knew we were going to be together for a while, but there were no apartments available. It was after the war, and they hadn't built anything for civilian use. So when Al heard about an apartment being available, his brother and sister-in-law were moving, and he said, let's get married. And that's what we did. After you married Albert, what was life like? Well, we lived in an apartment originally, and I still worked and Al uh, was working for uh, Canada Dry still. And then we wanted to have children. So um, Al thought he'd like to go into business for himself. And we moved to an area where he found a business with a partner and uh, started working there, put in long hours, and uh, by the time we were married for five years and we still had no children, we decided to adopt. Well, we started the adoption actually at four years. Uh, and there we were fortunate in a lawyer friend of ours who found uh, a child that we picked out, we loved, and, um, and we had our first baby. When we were married five years, and John was born, and um, by then I had stopped working, and then we looked for a house and found one not far from where Al worked, which was like 20 minutes. Uh, driving. Well, when John was two and a half years old, we moved to Springfield, a s suburb outside of Philadelphia that was only 20 minutes away from where Al worked. Uh, after he bought his partner out, it was his alone, and it was Mac Beverage, uh, beer and soda and water. Mac Beverage, all kinds of beverages. And then um, he bought the first automatic 
ice machine where you could put in your coins and get ice cubes or a block of ice out of. And everybody in the family worked at it. And I don't know the date, but I'll say eight years after John was born, oh, we were able to adopt Adam. Oh, both boys, as soon as they got their uh, driver's licenses, worked in the business. They both worked all summer. And then Adam seemed to take to the ice, ice business and worked on Saturdays with his father. How was the transition moving from Philadelphia to California, oh, yeah. East yeah. Coast to West Coast? Fortunately, we were all in good health until Al and I reached our 60s when I had ovarian cancer and survived it because almost everybody that was diagnosed with it had passed away and I still lived. I beat not only the surgery, but I beat the time. And uh, after the surgery, and, um, and recuperation, and I did fine. The doctors did say that they didn't think I would last more than five years. And uh, here it is, I'm 89, I'm still here and kicking. We lived, we lived in our house in Springfield for 52 years until Al and my health deteriorated enough that we finally uh, said yes to our son and daughter-in-law, uh, John and Julie, who lived on the West Coast. And we went out to uh, Los Angeles and we now live in a, a, an assisted living home, the reserve, which we liked very much and felt very much at home. He really liked Philadelphia better, he, he said, but he was very glad to be here, to be close to our children because we needed more help. What has life been like here the last couple months since he has passed? Everybody here is wonderful and makes me feel at home. They're very friendly and there's lots of help, both for taking care of my needs, and they did take care of Al too, took care of his needs very well. And since Al passed away, it's the first time really that I can remember not having to be responsible for somebody or take care of somebody. Now I have no more, no. Worry kind it, of? It, yeah, it's the first time that I haven't had to worry about anything or care personally for anybody's needs and just for myself. And it doesn't take much to get used to it. I think. I know I loved working in the lab. I really enjoyed that, had a lot of interesting experiences with that. Do you miss the snow from? Uh, not at all. I don't miss the snow and the ice. I miss the rain. You don't miss going out there yourself and shoving that snow out? No, no. That's what I did. I used to mow the lawn with with electric lawn mower, not electric, gas lawn mower. I, <laughs> my next door neighbor and I were the only women that mowed our lawns in Springfield because both our husbands were in business and put in long hours. And the men used to help us if we ran into trouble, you know, trying to get those lawn mowers to start. Do you think there was a special kinship from your generation? You guys went through the Depression, the war, uh, even mm -hmm. the Vietnam, Cold War crisis, all of that. Do you feel that you guys have somewhat 
something to unite over where today's generation doesn't? I think we were more resilient because we had to be. I think we valued life more and we really wanted to raise our kids to be, you know, moral and, and the, the best they could be. But to me, it's, it's the internet is the big, we've seen in my lifetime, I've seen a lot of changes, lots of changes. If you think just about in your kitchen, a dishwasher and uh, toaster ovens and um, crock pots and that kind of thing and the telephone, the refrigerator because I remember the ice box and having to empty the water from the ice melting, the toaster oven, the telephone, answering machine, uh, automobiles from being standard shift to automatic shift uh, and microwave. The automobiles now, um, when I first learned how to drive, it was, I was trying to learn how to drive, but I was, it was a stick shift car and I couldn't do it because I couldn't reach the pedals and see out the windshield at the same time. So I had to wait until they had the cars that were um, automatic shift. And then I was able to learn on that. But the biggest, the biggest change is the internet. And the thing that upsets me the most of most of people I know is that it, it so quickly keeps changing and in supposedly improving. In the beginning, when the computers came out, they said it would save paper. It would become a paperless society. Well, it's not. You get bills and things, they're great big pieces of paper. When that, when Al started in business, he had a little pot, pad the size of your hand that he would write orders even for a semi a truckload of merchandise for thousands of dollars would be on a little piece of paper. And now you have reams and reams and reams of paper. And the most scary thing is that the kids are glued to their iPhone, phones, iPads, whatever they are. They're not getting out and playing. They didn't play when they were little. Go out and play with kids. They're always with the pads, looking at them, not talking to anybody. I don't think that's good at all. Do you know what a selfie is? A what? No. What is? What is it? Um, I've heard the term, but I don't really know what it is. Yeah, it's where basically people are really absorbed in their iPhones. They turn it around so they take a picture of themselves like this. Oh, jeez. Yeah, and then, so it's very conceited. And yeah, the whole thing, it's, I don't know where that's going to lead. I hear too many negative things about it, really. Grandma, you've lived through the war, the depression, you've grown up and married a great man, you've had children and grandchildren, and what would you say, how do you feel about the legacy that you have left behind? Oh, I think a great life. We have, our kids are wonderful. Um, even though they're adopted, our sons, even though they're adopted, we always said, we did better that way than if we had had our own kids. They would have been short and fat. <laughs> <laughs> and and they, they really have grown to be wonderful young men and their their children too are we very very proud of our whole family my mother's family were the ones we were closest to because they were nearby um, my mother was one of eight children and they all married and had children so I grew up with lots of cousins and um, holidays we always got together and 
I missed that for our kids. Our kids didn't have that because by then the family was all dispersed. Uh, one son lived on the West Coast and one in Brooklyn. I always felt badly that my kids couldn't have grown up in an atmosphere like that. And knowing you have so much family support, it was a wonderful feeling. I, I, but I think we're pretty close considering we've been so far apart for such a long time. How tall are you, Grandma? I used to be 4'10", and then I have shrunk now that I've gotten old and I'm only four, six and a half. It's due to osteoporosis and, uh, and I'm old. <laughs> You're the most resilient four foot eight woman I know. <laughs>